Okay, um, thanks for sticking with us, everybody. Um, if everyone, um, we're gonna get some questions from the audience here in a second, but um, Peter, if you could introduce yourself, and then if everybody could kind of, the topic of this panel is related to the decentralized stack. Are we there yet? So um, if each of the panelists could kind of, if they wanted to say anything more else on their talk, and then kind of dive into where you guys either sit in the stack or what you're thinking out about as it relates to the decentralized stack. Just any introductory comments to get this conversation going. Sure. So, who? Yeah. Are you still there? Hello? 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 Okay. Now it's better. Okay. Um, so, hey, I'm uh, Peter from the Web3 Foundation. So. Uh, one of the things that uh, that uh, that we uh, we try to figure out is uh, how to bring all those different technologies together that are building decentralized protocols and and uh, make them work in such a way that you can really build decentralized applications on them and and then make uh, the users can use those decentralized applications that are built uh, on all those uh, different protocols and uh, some of the work is definitely has to be done on trying to figure out how the different protocols uh, are um, um, how, what things uh, they have in common, what kind of interfaces are, are between them. But what is also really important is, uh, um, uh, is to uh, acknowledge what, uh, what capabilities each, each of the protocols provides for building decentralized applications. And uh, um, when, we, when we build those decentralized applications, we really want to leverage capabilities that, uh, of many different protocols. So we've, s uh, you've, we've seen the, 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 uh, the proxy re-encryption and, and, uh, and uh, the uh, home morphing processing and, and uh, the curation markets and the decentralized databases. And if you build an application, ideally you would want to leverage all those different uh, different things. But then usually the uh, the the barrier is that is that all those protocols are running on completely different networks. They make use of a very different technology stack. So now when you're a developer, it takes it takes a lot of effort to try to get them to work together. And then when you are a user, you would need to be running three different nodes of three different protocols or many other nodes probably <laughs> in order to actually run an application that leverages those protocols. So, with um, uh, with projects like uh, like Polkadot and just generally efforts to, to kind of uh, bring projects together, we try to we try to kind of reduce this complexity or uh, pr produce toolings that will enable people to interact uh, to to build applications on those uh, uh, protocols, but also enable users to then interact with applications uh, using a single node underneath that that is able to 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 then uh, talk to all sorts of different protocols. So, yeah, that's some thoughts. You all boys, thanks for <laughs> such a good explanation. Yeah, well, uh, from from our, our point of view, we obviously just uh, one of the pieces which uh, which you use as, as a tool to uh, to keep the data encrypted all the time, um, and I guess we just fit in this uh, stack of protocol of many protocols you may you may need to use um, so yeah I can totally see how this integrations uh, integration of multiple protocols is uh, is very very important um, and yeah so um, I don't know if I can add anything more to that so I'm just <laughs> passing the microphone <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's really all right. Um, yeah, I totally agree that um, integration is important. And what about us? I would probably say we try to focus more on the uh, real-time aspect and on the um, efficiency aspect. Well, basically, um, coming from the industry, like, you know, the conventional industry world, I mean, I'm used to using Amazon, for example, and using it for really cheap, and it works fast enough. And when I'm looking at a lot of the like blockchain applications, I'm like, you know, that's that's a quite a huge difference. So what we are trying to focus more, uh, we are trying to basically relax um, the I would say security requirement, just you know, just a little bit, but in a, like for that to get more real time and more uh, cost efficiency. And yes, we also like want to play with all of the other. 
uh, protocols like IPFS and like build our network on top of two-bit batch validation, for example. So yeah, you you actually want to integrate well. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I think many people talk about layer one and layer two solutions, maybe also layer three. Um, I think you could uh, look at it as um, protocols that bring a utility to the space. Uh, we have a lot of decentralized virtual machines. We have some decentralized storage here and there. Uh, we have verified compute, zero knowledge. Uh, I, uh, from my regard, from the end consumer, the more of these networks competing against each other, the cheaper the cost. Um, um, I think what we try to do is really go into that layer two and uh, assume a level of abstraction such that uh, we can move over different networks and combine them together. Um, I think the most important thing is to realize that we should be building for developers right now because we have to develop a stack. Um, people talk about a lot about UX UI. I think then it's more like Def UX UI uh, currently. Um, the end consumer will have to wait a few more years in order for these things to scale and become mature. But, uh, that's it. Great. <coughs> in from the audience, if you guys have anything you particularly want to hear about, just yell it out. Um, anything related? You have four guys up here who know a, a lot. Yeah, yell it out, please. Hi. How long do you think it will take? for for the decentralized web to reach the masses. You know what I mean? Like when is the browser moment? When is like the Netscape moment where people open up and oh wow, there's a decentralized web. Yeah, mass adoption. Yeah, well, I think that uh it's it's not like some particular moment when it happens. Uh, it doesn't happen overnight, but certain things make uh, certain decentralized things are really taking off sometimes, and sometimes they are really like very noticeable. Like when you know when it happened with Crypto Kitties, uh, which um, which is was kind of cute. Um, but I think like everything which is. Uh, which is over regulated or everything which is um like uh which is susceptible to censorship or everything which may which has uh, uh big trust issues uh, in in these places decentralization uh, really really helps um and i mean who knows like what exactly will be one of the first applications whether it will be well Right now, we've seen it with uh, with decentralized uh, investing, but uh, it could be like uh, how it traditionally started with new technologies, with uh, uh, with adult industry, or it could be something uh, it could be something else. But I think it's like piece by piece, it will be uh, it will be taken off. Yeah, um, I think um, greed and fear are two main drivers for people to adopt something. Uh, Fear would be in maybe some South American countries where people s look at inflation, they tr don't trust the banks, and they see just their their assets devaluate over time, and then they tend to go to other networks that deliver better trust. Um, greed, yeah, people that are speculating, investing. And you, you pointed to a few other things. I think there's also sports, gambling, and porn. Uh, these are have been the drivers of the internet for a long while, and they will continue to do so. So maybe there you will see a lot of more interesting phenomena. Um, weird games like FOMO 3D, Proof of Weak Hands, uh, which is basically some very weird type of smart contracts with incentives and bonding curves and attrition games, and there's a lot of things to explore there. Um, so yeah, the curiosity for now. and these other drivers later. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I probably would add that when I'm, for example, talking to my friends who are completely outside of the blockchain or like decentralized world, they're always asking me, well, why would I use this technology? And I think when like a developer chooses whether to use the technology or not, um, well, well, they, try to evaluate the cost of like how much effort do you need to make uh, to use the technology. So if you basically in a few years uh, make an effort to for the basic like 
ease of use of a technology and it the use like the ease of use of the technology will be comparable to what we have in the uh, traditional world then um, maybe developers won't need to suffer from lots of pain like basically you describe the pain of the I know like adult industry developers but if you make the tools uh, easy enough to use then even the uh, more engineers from the industry uh, begin to use the decentralized stack as well. I probably may add something more from a little philosophical point of view. And uh, I think that the world becomes like more and more global and uh, borders between countries make uh, less and less sense. But in the meantime, countries are pretty... I would say pretty hostile to each other, or they are suspicious about each other. And uh, people who live in those countries, they don't necessarily want to uh, want to live in this uh, siloed world. Uh, so, and I think uh, d decentralization, it actually gives people means to get around those limitations, uh, to kind of, let's say, Sometimes it doesn't matter who people vote for when on, during the elections. They cannot really change the system they live in, but they do want to do it. And uh, decentralization is a way to, for people to actually vote by, by action. So, and this is um, one thing I was uh, thinking sometimes about. <laughs> so... Uh, I think I think currently there is uh, there is uh, 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 w when one tries to make a make a mainstream application or an application that will uh, pick up maybe not in mainstream but within a certain domain there is uh, a lot of a lot of uh, user experience hurdles that are being introduced by the underlying protocol so it's uh, it's the transactions take very long to process they, you often need some sort of uh, some capital upfront in order to make a transaction it's hard to store a file somewhere and distribute it to, to, to all the users. It's hard to send a message if you don't want to send a transaction, just broadcast even a simply a messages, uh, message on the, on the decentralized network. And, and when you build an application, you every time you need to kind of either try to, try to invent a protocol around it or, or do some uh, very hard tricks in order to actually make it something that, uh, that is uh, comparable to, to, to a traditional application. And uh, and I think what we what we really need to drive for is uh, is a design of uh, pr protocols that uh, that really try to uh, uh, then make uh, developers' uh, life uh, much easier. Uh, so um, so coming up with uh, with new protocols kind of around uh, around blockchain that will support the development on blockchain. So so file storage and and P two P messaging. Uh, enable easier experimentation in terms of in terms of building new chains and and uh, with new kinds of characteristics that that will that would have a better experience when you develop on them so let's say if uh, faster transaction processing and and so on um, or, uh, or or kind of different different fee uh, fee schemes um, so and light clients so that you don't need to syn synchronize few gigs of data if you want to use uh, in a trustless uh, manner a decentralized application on your phone and uh, so I think what like first like uh, of course we need those better protocols but I think also what what we can do in the first place and what we try to do with Polka is also a design a design kind of uh, uh, bits of uh, bits of infrastructure and protocols that actually allow us to experiment with new protocols uh, and allow us to easily and quickly deploy new chains and move on from the old ones that maybe didn't have that good characteristics to the new ones that have better characteristics. So I think uh, we kind of got a bit stuck with this first iteration that wasn't that good, but now maybe instead of trying to go through this very painful process of doing the second generation, rather maybe we should lay the ground for, for ongoing experimentation and ongoing evolution of those protocols. Um, and uh, I think this is what does what will ultimately enable us to to long term get to a place where where all those protocols are um, you can actually build on them and and distribute to to, to your users. Great. In any other any other comments on that from the audience or, or shout outs of topics we should talk about? 
One thing I'm, I'm curious about is we have a number of projects working on different components of data, whether it's re-encryption or whether it's unleashing it for innovators or um, storing it. There's a number of big companies that we all use every day that have a lot of data um, and are getting more and more data through whether it's their devices or whether, the, whether it's the services they provide, Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon, the GAFA. Um, whenever you guys think about that, um, wh how do you guys think about that in terms of tackling them? Because they're getting more data through their AI assistants, through their services, and through their search. Um, and, you know, for instance, Dimitri, you're, you're working on getting data into Ocean. Um, how do you compete against what those service providers and those, those hardware providers? Yeah. Um. I must point out, I was surprised about it, but Apple is quite privacy friendly, so mm. just saying that. Um, so in at least you can drop Apple. Um, they don't listen to your phone. Um, the others do, of course. Um, what we do is, well, we offer uh, basically a way for the data owner, um, and let's, let's start with all those SMEs and middle companies that aren't leaking to Google, but still want to basically convert their data silo into a data scientist magnet um, without having data escapes and privacy, uh, provable privacy and all these things. I think that's kind of where we first see that we can, we can help uh, existing businesses. Another thing we're trying to do is promote uh, the commons, uh, things that are free, uh, things that just should be made available and I having incentives to do so, to, so mm. to turn paid assets into publicly available assets through different types of incentive schemas. Um, that's something else than uh, having Google control your data. That means that a company cannot monetize, they always have to buy from Google. So we are trying to level the playing field in some ways. It's going to mm -hmm. be tough, but I think at least we have to try it. Um, yeah. yeah, I can probably add to this that uh, in 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 Europe, like there is uh, the GDPR law, which ab obviously everybody uh, heard about, and uh, large corporations who uh, who used to actually monetize all this data, they cannot so easily drop this model, and now they they, they probably will start looking for a solution. Just to give you an example, without quoting the source, uh, I can I can tell you that uh, like Microsoft, for example planned to planned to before the G GDPR to lose four billion dollars in fines in the first year of GDPR and they of course don't like it but they still prefer to do it but of course they are looking for solution as, as well as many other big companies affected by GDPR so this kind of things uh, such as so like, like GDPR or maybe it's uh, analogs in other uh, in other places uh, they could help uh, actually those large companies to uh, to collaborate with decentralized projects, so I think it's actually the right moment in history to uh, to try to uh, to kind of uh, decentralize the data ownership uh, in a way. Well, I would probably also add that um, it would be really nice to have uh, to actually see some help from the community here, and I'm not only talking about the community like in the decentralized world, but also maybe some developers that are working for Amazon, or like some developers that are working, well, maybe not for Apple, but like for other companies, mm -hmm. they would, they might see the value in um, integrating with the decentralized networks, and because, just because that's cool, and maybe one day they will be able to convince their, you know, like managers and decision makers to basically allow that, well, hopefully in this case, the data, like at least some of these companies' data uh, might flow in uh, into the decentralized networks. Well, at least that would be ideal, <laughs> I guess. I, and related to that, I think more people flow from the Web 2.0 platforms towards the decentralized community than the other way back. Uh, at least for me, I mean, I, I wouldn't be able to go back to <laughs> an enterprise. Same here. <laughs> <laughs> no, I wouldn't go to back to enterprise either. <laughs> yeah, I think the use is more for the developers too. So. No, makes sense. Yeah, once you go decentralization, you never go back. <laughs> so, 
like some some of those things obviously can re re uh, uh, re emphasize the business model for hoarding uh, data right so if you if you let people easily for instance sell access to to your data for let's say purpose of training their models then then you incentivize people basically keeping a, a silo of data that they can then sell access to right so um, uh, so with with all of those protocols I think I think we just we just have more opportunities to create new kinds of incentive schemes and some of them might be acting in a way of re-emphasizing the, the silos and s some of them hopefully can also act uh, in terms of uh, uh, um, um, redistributing the data or opening up the data uh, or, or keeping the data more private. We just have more, more techniques uh, at our fingertips, hopefully, to, to lead it in the right direction. What um, did you want to comment, Michael? Oh, yeah, just uh, one small analysis, another small comment. So uh, sometimes the data is already open, um, such as data in public internet, and you, the companies who try to enter the space, they still experience difficulties. Compare, let's say, if you want to start a new search engine, you obviously will face competition with Google, and uh, Google has really enormous resources. So, for example, they they can fetch, they can have their own optical fibers across oceans and they can fetch like internet in, in a day or something to, to their data centers. So no startup can really compete with that, even if they come up with some uh, like groundbreaking search algorithm. So that's, uh, and that kind of keeps uh, new startups from, uh, from competing with existing giants. But the decentralized infrastructure can give, uh, give a way for like volunteers to, uh, to give their computers to like new startups uh, as tools to, to basically ex to explore these public data sets and uh, you know, this, uh, the scale of this can be actually already comparable with existing uh, internet giants. And uh, startups, even though they are small, can in fact compete with them. Um, and so I think uh, that's kind of this, the scale of the tool of decentralization uh, is actually uh, something which, which can bring like some, uh, some adoption or like can bring a realization of new good algorithms to uh, to be available to the masses. Mm -hmm. Basically helps uh, uh, somewhat tying into that, it helps with coordination. So usually it requires a lot of effort to either gather data or to acquire uh, data. So there has to be a big organization that for instance acquires the data and, and decentralized technologies generally speaking can allow larger groups of fairly independent people to coordinate themselves to actually gather data or to acquire data so uh, so no, now not only those centralized organizations can 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 do that but also hopefully the centralized organizations that have a lot of disparate stakeholders that are not doing it only for a, or for a single use case but rather just uh, happen to align using those decentralized technologies mm -hmm. yeah i think Looking at just value capture uh, from the application layer versus the protocol layer, um, that kind of switches over. Uh, protocols run tokens. Tokens are carrying information of attribution, work delivered, uh, basically assigning it at the right uh, points in the stack. Um, so every contributor is incentivized to participate in any layer of the stack and not just the, 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 the top application layer, which is how the web is wired right now. Um, so I think that's kind of a, a game changer. Um, it also incentivizes open source to exist um, because now open source is just getting eaten up, get eaten up and spit out in, a, in something like Facebook or whatnot. Um, so yeah, I think that's promising. What do you think are some of the implications, and everybody please jump in, of the, the fact that users are, can be the service providers of this lower level protocol, these foundational protocols upon which this new economy or these new economies will be built on? So yeah, I, the biggest, biggest uh, implication in my opinion would be that work and equity merge into one thing which is we call token. Um, so you're not only getting compensated for the service, you also become a stakeholder in that portion of the network. Rather than what we have now is that we have VCs 
at one side and workers at the other side, and it's difficult to bridge a gap. So that's for me the one of the most big incentives so for people to participate. They become stakeholder in any layer of that network. Well, I would probably also add to that that in the traditional startup world, when you say, for example, like lots of the companies, uh, they eventually get sold to the bigger ones, and uh, lots of the small startups, like when they get financing, like in the Silicon Valley, for example, well, Amazon, Microsoft, Google, well, like we will probably get acquired, we will acquire them or acquire them, and so on. And we, when you have a decentralized network, and this network is not entirely always controlled by like you know a single company and when the source code is open well it gets much harder for the uh, big company you know to get its its hands on this decentralized network and i think that's a really good thing for the entire community yeah and uh, i think the uh, one of the things which tokenization also help with helps with is uh, um, monetization of very very low level protocols like for example uh, open SSL or PGP or like open PGP they have they don't have way too many people working on that especially like open SSL probably uh, or the world would uh, benefit from more people working on such a critical uh, infrastructure components as that and tokenization gives uh, uh, gives the ability to uh, to basically finance uh, very fundamental things which uh, otherwise are free and uh, like the they were impossible to monetize uh, but now you don't even like monetize that you just support uh, development of of these low level things and that's very important because uh, like uh, probably everybody heard about uh, about bugs in open SSL leading to uh, like hard bleed attack and so on and if uh, possibly if uh, this uh, uh, such uh, critical components were like self self-financed in much more sustainable way uh, that probably would, wouldn't have happened and maybe when every single component of uh, new web of uh, will be uh, will be self-sustainable like that uh, probably we will have uh, more secure and better internet uh, while preserving the data data privacy and uh, while uh, um, while being like more democratic in a way um, so the generally, if, uh, it it becomes uh, uh, in a, I don't know exactly what the question was, but but uh, uh, generally speaking, uh, I think I think that uh, what is what is uh, important with with, uh, 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 with 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 the payments and and ability to kind of distribute uh, value to different participants in the kind of the value creation chain is that currently. Currently, the centralized parties that are that are making products, providing services, they we rely on them to then distribute it fairly amongst them, amongst the different contributors that contribute towards towards providing a certain service or or uh, or something that we consume uh, at the end. And with those with those decentralized protocols, we and applications, we have a we have a chance to have uh, much more uh, fine grained. Uh, 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 attributability so basically we can see exactly where each piece of value that we are getting comes from and we can uh, reward it uh, proportionately so there is uh, some projects like in the music industry for instance with licensing where rather than having some sort of uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, aggregation uh, company that that then sells you licenses to different pieces of music and then it's up to them to kind of distribute it down the uh, down all the way down to the artist uh, now we can potentially keep track of all those uh, all those people in the in the whole chain that have provided actually value and and it's much clearer how how we can uh, pay them or with protocols you know it might be that one protocol enable us to route a message efficiently through through the network and another to, to encrypt it somewhere and another to something else and and uh, um, this attributability uh, creates a lot of, uh, of uh, rewards a lot of people that were not rewarded right now uh, because because it's just much easier to s see what are we relying on and it's much easier to distribute it, the, the, the value uh, uh, fairly across the across participants. Great. We have final thoughts. Yeah, there's actually another really cool thing you can do with these networks. Um, 
think of them as unstoppable substrates for uh, virtual life to exist. Um, there's things like Terra Zero, uh, which is basically a self-owned forest, no human guardian. It's basically controlled by a smart contract, owns its own funds. Nobody really owns the contract. Uh, so you have like this piece of software that's self-sovereign in its wallet. Um, you have DAOs. If they're really a DAO, there's also not many humans in the loop and there's decision making internally. So we're at this point in time where we can plant either good or bad viruses <laughs> on networks and they will keep on living and they can own and control resources so they can spend money, they can receive money. Um, they can maybe have legal status. Uh, it's in Malta is, is going to that direction so they could sue people. So somewhere in, in history we're at this point in time where we're experimenting with non-human agents that can do a lot of functions that they couldn't do before. I think that's maybe something to think about. Blockchain is bootstrapping AI into existence. And Skynet and other <laughs> stuff. <laughs> Very cool. Well, thank you, panel, for coming out um, and participating. It's been fun. <laughs> Last announcement. If you guys like this T-shirt, I have a lot more. It's uh, for the Web3 Summit, which is October 22nd in Berlin. Uh, I think every team participating tonight is going to be represented there, as well as a bunch of other teams. So uh, let me know if, you, if you'd like it, what's called the Web3 Summit. Thank you.